Hey guys, uh, my name is Purun Balachandran and uh, I'm the co-founder of Nodestar. Uh, Nodestar is a Web3 strategy and advisory firm helping people with fundraising, strat um, strategy, partnerships, business development, and game economies. And I'm here with uh, one of my clients, Karn, who I'll let him introduce himself. Hey guys, my name is Karn, founder, founder of Golden Studios Rage Effect. Um, effectively, we are India's first to play shooter. We, we did launch last year. And uh, we're trying to build a cross-play shooter across PC, mobile, uh, we're coming soon on PS5 next next year as well. So maybe we're not coming too soon, uh, but it's in the works. Um, and yeah, and technically, when you Google India's first pay-to-own game, it says Josh, J-O-S-H, right? Joint Operation Secret Heroes, which is Rage Effect. So I guess um, through Google, you could say we are India's first pay-to-own game. Yeah. Also, we started off three years ago. Um, so yeah, that's that. A quick intro. Awesome. So. Um, the original uh, topic for this talk was blockchain in AAA gaming, a paradigm shift. Um, but we actually used AI to make this presentation, um, so we decided to include that in the title as well. Um, so we're going to be touching on various topics today related to blockchain gaming. So I mean, one of the things we're going to be talking about today is what is Web3, right? Like, obviously there's blockchain, but Web3 is really a collection of technologies, including AR, VR, mixed reality. We're going to be talking about how these technologies and the ethos that go alongside them have an impact on both players, developers, investors, as well as communities. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about Web3 Gaming over the last few years, you know, what has been successful, what are the models that have worked, and then why do they all eventually fail and peter out? Um, we're gonna be talking about the impact and the challenges. We're gonna be talking about if you're a game developer, how can you get your game funded in Web3? Um, and you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about AI as well, what the hype is, separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And uh, yeah, so that's, our, that's what we're going to be discussing today. Sounds good, sounds good. So just a quick show of hands, guys. How many of you have, been, have dabbled in Web3? How many of you have invested in crypto? Hold something, hold NFTs? So that's about 40%. Yeah, it look, looks like 40%, right? Cool enough. So you guys are aware of what blockchain is, right? A digital le ledger uh, connected through blocks containing information, that's the, that's the definition of it. But it's a whole lot complex than that. Um, but Perun, you want to talk more about de decentralization? Yeah, I'm also curious, how many in the audience, how many of you guys are game developers? That's, that's and how many of you guys have built Web3 games? All right, so like the number keeps falling. Three, yeah. It's like the Venn diagram is actually pretty limited. Um, but that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, obviously, it's a relatively new technology. There's a lot of regulatory issues around, around it, um, especially in India. And I live in the US now where it's kind of becoming a little bit more accepted, but there are no clear guidelines, so it's hard to build companies without like, the necessary regulation. But in terms of ethos, right, there are like four key aspects of, at least in my opinion, about Web3. One is a decentralized aspect. Really, um, a lot of the talks today that we've had so far have talked about, hey, you know, Apple, Google, they're taking 30% of our earnings. So blockchain essentially provides an infrastructure where like those fees like come down to like tiny fractions of percentages or basis points, making it much easier for you to monetize your content and keep a large share of your revenue. Um, the other large as aspect of that is user empowerment. I mean, this happens in multiple ways. One is of course ownership over your data, ownership over your assets, right? You have a self-custodial wallet, that's where your assets are stored. The other thing that's important as well is like, and some people don't like this, I was talking to someone who's not a fan of this, but in a way, your community and your users become your investors, right? Um, because often they're buying your tokens and they're buying your NFTs even before you made the game because they're essentially fundraising from you to be able to build that game out. So they're raising on the strength of that concept. Yeah, I'm not entirely a fan of that either as a, as a wealthy founder. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I'll let you continue. So, but tell me, why aren't you a fan of it? I mean, look, it's, um, it's and we'll touch more about this later on in the, in the presentation as well, but it's really a question of who your audience is, right? Who your community is, who you're building the product for, who you're building the game for. And again, you know, the keyword is game, not product, not gamified finance, not DeFi, but a, but a game that people enjoy. You guys are at IGDC. Um, you are gamers, you know, most of you must, must be. Um, but if these guys turn into investors, then that's a, that's a big pain point, right? Because now they're expecting things from you. They're expecting dividends. They're expecting bigger returns. They're expecting, um, you know, just something to come out and just continuously keep on coming out. 
And uh, that's been a problem for a lot of Web3 games, and that's why a lot of them have failed. That's why a lot of them have sort of burnt out, churned out. Um, and that actually is a problem that we'll speak a bit more about later on. But yeah. What you're saying is they sound like traditional investors, but actually they, at least they play your game, you know what I mean? So that's... <laughs> the, 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 the better type of investors, you can say, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm just kidding, but you know, another big thing is obviously interoperability, and I'm honestly, I'm not sure how I feel about this. So interoperability is this idea that you can create an asset in one game and take it to another game. So imagine there's a car game, right? Um, you buy a car in that game and you play it, and then someone else comes up with another game, it's a garage game, right? You can upgrade your car, put new wheels on it. So you can take this car from the car game, take it to this garage, upgrade the car, and bring it back to the original game. Now, this is an interesting concept because that means like, hey, you know, you have one identity, one asset that you can continue to build on, right? It's not like I can't take my FIFA Ultimate Team and put it into PES or I can't go from NBA 2K23 to like 22. There's no interoperability in that sense. But the problem is every time they release a new game or a new DLC or a new asset, traditional Web2 game companies are making money. And that is the money that's used to fund future game development. But now in Web3, if I'm buying an asset in one game and I expect to be able to take it to the other game, where is that other game getting money to continue developing and creating content for people? Yeah, exactly. I think that's, that's a studio side type of you know, dilemma to have. Uh, on the user front, I think people are going to be happy with it. Right? Imagine if you can take your players from Ultimate Team FIFA 23 to EAFC 24. I mean, that's a win-win, right? You're, you're taking the same team, um, you know, except it being reset. Uh, for, for the entire player base. So that's one thing. I mean, we are backed by Solana Ventures and uh, you know, we're pretty close with all the Solana projects, on, on, uh, especially in gaming, gaming projects. So we do have a lot of conversations about interoperability and which assets we can have together and which assets we can share. And you know, I mean, the, the, it, it gets a bit more in, de in depth after that because then you're talking about the engines you, you're using, the tech you're using, the architecture you're using. But there are some infra companies who are, you know, coming in, into the space, and they have been here for a while, and we are working with some who are helping with the interoperability of it all. So um, that's a big trend that, we'll, that we're looking at, and uh, we think that's a big trend to look out for the future. Wait, so uh, let's talk about my favorite Web3 game ever, Axie Infinity. The GOAT. Um, this started the bull run in Web3 gaming, and it also ended the bull run, right? Like. Um, so actually, Infinity is interesting. It's like basically a Ponzi scheme um, and, or a pyramid scheme. The idea is you have to buy these assets to be able to play the game, right? And then once you play the game, you have to continue essentially investing in assets and getting other users into the game to invest in assets to create a larger pot, and you'll get a larger share based on how many people you get in. The big reason for the success of this game was like the guild system that happened in Vietnam, where they were basically people who were investing and allowing scholars to come in, buying these assets for them, monetizing them, and then continuing to bring more and more people into that game. Um, so on the face of it, it was quite an interesting concept when it first came out, right? Because it made this idea of like essentially being able to earn a living wage while being able to play a game, an actual reality. But once you realize that was all built on tokenomics, so they were building, they had two currencies. One is the Axie token and then the Ron, uh, Ronin token. So essentially the Ronin token, the in-game currency was created because the Axie token was getting too diluted. So their solution to creating value and creating value for players, instead of actually creating like long-term game economies, was to basically create a new token. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about this a little bit more, Karnan, as a game Yeah, developer. I mean, I'm obviously, clearly, guys, if you guys have heard of Axie Infinity, I'm sure you're not fans of it as a, as a Web3 founder. Um, I'm definitely not. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a bit of a, a failure towards the end when people started realizing that, you know, dual token economies, they're not working well. Um, and the fact that it is a pyramid of sorts, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it gave rise to the, the concept of play to earn. And it, I remember when FTX crashed, there was, I mean, Breakpoint, Breakpoint was around that time and it is very coincidental, I guess, that FTX crashed during Solana Breakpoint. But um, I think there was another event, a global blockchain event after that, where there was a consensus. I think it was 2049, I was there, but I, I, I didn't directly hear it from anyone. But the global consensus there was that um, people were switching from play to earn to play and earn, right? So now you're not playing a game to earn certain money out of it. 
but you're playing a game and earning. So you're actually gamers, and just earning money, earning real life money is a side effect of gaming, the way it should be, right? So Actually, yeah. I loved Axie Infinity. They were giving me 70% APRs on my staking. Um, I mean, but when you, when you understand that concept, right, the whole idea of this game was that you either buy Axie or Ronin, you put it into this DeFi vault, you're not actually playing a game at that point anymore, you're investing. And they're like, yeah. hey, if you keep it in here to provide liquidity to the rest of the pool, we're going to mint more tokens, and we're going to give you these tokens. So from what you're hearing, it's not a game, right? It's more gamified finance in a puzzle format. And yeah, it's, just, it's never going to work. Uh, but it was making people money, so it worked out, you know. But I guess we can... We're going to skip over this a little bit, but Zed Run was a similar concept, innovative game. They were allowing people to basically breed horses and then race them digitally. Um, their problem was a little bit different, but what happened was like it was player consolidation. It was essentially pay to win. So all like the initial players and the top players, they all got the best horses, and they would continue to dominate and win all the races afterwards. So it became impossible as a new player to enter this gaming ecosystem because there was already a hierarchy established. Um, Traditionally in gaming, obviously, that's why new games are released each year and new seasons are released so that the hierarchy of the leaderboard resets. And it seems like that's not really happened in Web3, which has been a large problem with why these games are kind of like a crash and burn sort of system. Yeah, and Zedlin is just one example of many, right? I mean, I've invested in a lot of companies back in 21, um, obviously 22 as well, and they've all gone down to zero. And they all had similar economies, and you know, there was, there was this entire FOMO thing where, hey, you know, this, this token is going up. Uh, but no one really understood uh, the core mechanics of how the tokens work or how the NFTs work or what the long-term value is. Um, and that's, that's another reason why play to own sort of fail, right? And uh, even economies now, they have to be um, properly created and, you know, we're also taking our own good time with that. But, uh, yeah, let's, let's move on. I'm curious, like in the audience, like uh, when you guys are game developers, when you guys are building games, do you guys like actually like use a product like Machinations, for example, to map out your game economy to understand whether it's whether it's crypto or whether it's like you know virtual tokens, like how many tokens there are in the economy, who are the people who are getting it, what percentage, and what are the kind of actions that are taking? Just by like a show of hands, if you guys do any kind of simple modeling, whether that's in Excel or like a data analytics software, do you guys uh, model out your game economies? Okay, you got one, one person and two. There you go. Yeah, that, that's like the most important thing, right? Uh, I think even above gameplay, because if your economy model is a bit, mm, uh, yeah, your game is not going anywhere. It could be the best game of all time, but yeah, if your economy is like Axis, I mean, you're, you're, you're done in the dust. I, I think this is much more important to do in Web3. I, not so, I don't think it's as important yes. or necessary yeah. in like, you know, Web2. But the problem with Web3 is that a lot of your audience at that point is playing your game because they're earning something that can be converted into real money, right? So now, if you can imagine, if there's too much money in the game, if they're extracting too much value, then all of a sudden your economy will collapse, and you'll see a fluctuation in users who are all going to run and exit your game because that money is not worth as much. It's like a bank run. It's, uh, I mean, you're basically left with the situation of what happened in Zimbabwe, you know, where like uh, you basically like you had to pay a million Zimbabwe dollars to get a piece of bread. That that whole sort of bank run inflation scenario is happening in real time in a lot of these Web3 games. Um, which is quite ironic. Yeah, pump and dumps. But I think let's, let's move on. Let's move on to the next slides. We've got some time. Uh, you want to take this as a player? Yeah. So, you know, uh, why do I like Web3 gaming, right? Like, one of the concepts that really drew me to this was like, hey, I actually can own my assets within this game. I'm a big FIFA player. Every year I buy a FIFA Ultimate Team. Now I guess it's EAFC. Um, and I invest money in getting these players, putting together a team. And at the end of each year, my team is gone. So the next year, I have to buy the game again and accumulate my team again for the first time. So with Web3, when I buy an asset, when I buy an NFT, whatever that may be, the promise was like, hey, I'm going to be able to play with this asset for many years to come. Another good example is that there are two games. I believe it was Apex Legends, and I forget the name of the second game now. Um, they were mobile games published by EA that EA decided to shut down basically about a year or two into operation because they weren't very successful. Now, thousands of people had bought cosmetics, assets, other types of you know, things within this game that they never got a refund on. They couldn't even access those. At least in Web3, where it's all a digital ledger, 
these assets would be owned by the players in their self-custodial wallet. So you guys as game developers, if like, you know, someone shuts down a game, you guys as game developers can be like, hey, you can bring that asset into my game. I'll let you convert it for this skin or for this weapon or whatever that may be. Interoperability. Exactly. And then now it allows you to basically acquire users much more cheaply by offering them this like simple solution to something that happened to like a sort of competitor game. Um, the other thing obviously for a lot of people as we talked about with Axie is like you, you can actually make money, right? Like um, that's an important thing of hey, we can, we all like love games. That's what we do as a passion. You guys build games, I play games and I'm not a very good developer. But if I could, you know, play FIFA for the rest of my life and make money doing it, why wouldn't I? And the thing is, like, now that actually happens, right? That's competitive game economies exist, esports exist, they're content creators. Um, but even that money, especially within esports, it's concentrated at a very top tier of players. It's not accessible to everyone. You have to be, like, you know, top 1% in the world to be able to live and earn, or even probably 0.5%, honestly, to be able to live and learn, uh, earn on, like, an esports salary. But now when you can create value through these like decentralized prize pools by creating tokens that eventually take value based on the network economy, then you can actually create real environments where there's like actual money going to players in these competitive ecosystems that I think is really valuable. Um, what, Khan, do you want to touch on some of the cons? I mean, you're a player as well. Yeah, I mean, as a developer, I could have a few more points which we'll have at the next slide. Um, but yeah, so guys, I mean, regarding cons, I'll, I'll speak a bit more about the challenges later on. But yeah, some pros as, as a game studio looking at, you know, having your own uh, in-game token. And what that does is, if, if you create a good enough economy, it can sustain itself, which is very hard to do, believe me. Uh, it can help fund the game itself. So that's good. Obviously, you have many more revenue streams. So if you, once you enter the fundraising market, you're going to see that your valuation is actually much higher than than your counterpart Web2 games, right? Because you have many more types of revenue streams, you have NFTs, you have royalties, you have commissions, you have sales from partner projects. Partnerships are huge in Web3, right? So that's another big avenue to look into when, once you enter Web3. Um, and obviously you've got decentralized distribution, which is you know, not having middlemen sort of act for you and sort of being, you know, uh, working with these launchers, which you know, at least in the early stage, they're pretty, pretty um, they work well with you and you've got blockchains backing you, so that's always a plus sign. Um, but regarding cons, I guess, yeah, we'll speak more about the cons of the later slides, because there's the, there are much more cons than just the three ones listed here. So uh, yeah, let's move on. Impact of Web3 in gaming. So we've, we've spoken about interoperability and how impactful that can be and how impo impactful that is going to be and that is a future trend to look out for. Um, but if you look at you know, across genres, um, what use cases you're going to find mostly. So we're building a shooter, right? We're building like a Counter-Strike on mobile, on PC, uh, with an Indian touch to it. So when you look at the shooter genre, what people care more about when they play Counter-Strike or Call of Duty and whatnot, or Valorant, is the cosmetics, right? They care about the skins, they care about how rare the skin is. They don't care much about how many coins they're earning or you know, how the coin is distributed to everyone else. They care more about the cosmetics. And that's what we are focusing on as well, and that's what I think um, we as an industry now are looking into as well, which is, the term for it is Web 2.5, right? Where you're not sort of fully inducing into Web 3, you're not going all in, you're not doing a DAO, you're not having a governance model. Uh, you're just doing NFTs, you're putting things that are needed to be put in some sense, um, and which are useful, which have useful use cases, but don't necessarily overdo everything, right? And um, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of limitations that come with adding additional unnecessary stuff, and that we'll talk about in a while. Uh, but cosmetics is something that I've highlighted in, in green, because I think that's one thing that's going to help a whole lot. And NFTs have four main uh, use cases, right? They have the fact that they're transparent, authentic, uh, you can verify if someone has an authentic NFT that was, you know, uh, published by the studio itself, launched by the studio itself. The fact that it's interoperable, and uh, yeah. yeah, and I mean, I think there's one other thing I kind of want to add and highlight, and this is one of the coolest examples I've seen of Web3 in recent history. Um, so the guy who uh, came up with Words for Friends, he's making a new game. It's called Wildcard Alliance, right? It's like a MOBA-type game. And what's very interesting is that it actually allows for player-spectator interaction. So your audience members 
can essentially contribute to you if you're like, for example, playing the game in real time. So they can give you health points, they can give you like weapons, like they can bring you back to life if you need to respawn. And they can, it creates a very interesting sort of community-based economy that I don't think really exists in streaming right now, right? Like right now, the way we watch is like we go to Twitch, we go to YouTube, we watch someone play, maybe we comment. But imagine being able to do that in real time while actually contributing to the success of like your favorite creator or your favorite streamer or your favorite player um, really creates a really interesting dimension and probably strengthens your community in a way yes. that is not currently possible. It was called Spectate to On. And I think this was, from what I remember, it was brought forward by Monkey Ball in late 2021, about around November, so like two years ago. Um, it didn't work out well, although there was a bull market back then. Um, but yeah, I think some people, like you're mentioning, the project you mentioned, I think they, they're trying to perfect it. And let's see where it goes, but it is a very interesting concept, and the fact that you know, people are going to be more uh, close than ever, especially communities, I think that's one, one trend to look out for. Sweet, now we are jumping into AI and gaming. AI and gaming, so, um, you know, I was thinking about what AI could do in different genres, like in the previous slide it was mentioned, you know, shooters, mobas, and all these different hyper-casual stuff. Um, but really, when you look at AI and gaming, you're looking at things across all genres, right? And when we thought about it, really some things that came to mind, by the way, the two pictures you see there of Rage Effect, uh, that's made using Photoshop AI. Uh, sorry, outsourcers. <laughs> but you don't necessarily need you know, artwork outsourcing anymore, to some degree at least, because you've got brilliant AI that's being made by these Photoshop guys. Um, and yeah, so I mean, you're looking at things like asset creations, environment creations, right? You've got uh, text to 3D assets, which is in its very early stages. Uh, we've tried a few. We've tried, I think, Alpha 3D, but they're pretty, they're, they're very new, so uh, we probably won't go ahead with them. Uh, but you've got world building for lore, uh, we just tried Tools a Day a few days ago, and it creates every single thing that you put it in you know, as an input, so that's a pretty good tool to have. Um, AI NPCs and behavioral systems. Um, show of hands, how many of you have played Shadow of Mordor? One, two, that's it. You guys, like three, four, there you go. Some new ads. I mean, so you, 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 you've played the game, you know the Nemesis system, right? And you know how, the, how good that is and how that's gonna change. Uh, it, I guess it can't change the industry because they patented it, unfortunately. Uh, good news in case you weren't aware, uh, the studio that made it, Monolith, they're making the Wonder Woman game. So the Nemesis system is gonna be in the Wonder Woman game as well. And that's one th something to look out for. So we'll speak more about that in the next slide. I'll, I'll touch upon it slightly. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, but yeah, we've got text to animation, um, which is happening as well on Unity AI. So we've applied for beta access, but let's see how that turns out. Um, so yeah, just in short, I mean, you guys are aware of, I mean, the four of you are aware of how it is, but to, the, to others who are not, uh, effectively, they used Gen AI back in 2014. And effectively, what that was, what that was doing was, Every enemy that you have inside the game, they learn everything about you through your actions. They form relationships against you. They form alliances against you. You know, they level up in their ranks. They have better clothing, better armor, etc. When that happens, they remember your encounters with their friends, their families, um, and they develop a sort of um, relationship with you as well, right? They might hate you. They might love you. They might be incoherent. Um, so it's a, it's a very fun game to play, and it's something that I've never played before, and un unfortunately they patented it. But um, let's see how Wonder Woman turns out. We're gonna go into questions in a second, but I mean, the real value of like AI is I think it reduces time to market and cost to market. So now if you have a game idea, you don't really need to make all the marketing collateral. Soon you're not gonna have to make all the videos. Soon you're not gonna have to, and even like potentially you could just run a bot or an algorithm to do all your social media and marketing. And then in the future, you'll even be able to create the game sort of assets and environment, like 3D assets directly from AI, right? Like the, the value proposition of that is huge. Um, so if you're an indie developer, I think, you know, it's a very exciting time to be an indie developer. For sure, for sure. I mean, we spent uh, like, you know, well above $10,000 on our artwork for Age Effect. And uh, this Photoshop AI just did all of that. Not all of that, but quite, quite significantly, quite a few things for us uh, for free, because it is free, right? So. Uh, do check it out if you are an indie developer. And uh, yeah, let's jump into some questions that we thought would be de beneficial. I do, before we get there. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me, however, like outside of some of these more obvious use cases of AI, 
is sort of the personalization angle, right? Like, so whenever you guys develop games, you break down your users into various personas. You're like, all right, this is what the user is, is an achiever. This person's a grinder. Hey, this person likes doing this, right? Um, and usually it's hard to build game economies that are dynamic to individuals because individual preferences change over time. And there's also a big difference between like what are like revealed preferences and what are like stated preferences. So what a person says they like to do versus what a person actually does in a game. And now with AI, and it's been possible with machine learning as well, but you know, with neural networks, it becomes much more efficient to design game economies and token economies that dynamically evolve in response to how a user's behavior changes throughout the course of a game. And it becomes much easier than to retain those users as well, so you can like start now providing incentives to them if you notice that, hey, this person is not playing as much as they used to, um, or we've noticed that this person is spending more time doing this in the game, which is not as valuable to us as developers in terms of monetization. Instead of having to track that and build a loop for each of those scenarios, those loops can now be created dynamically with AI, right? So that is kind of another type of level of personalization that I'm kind of looking forward to seeing in the next year or two, maybe starting with larger studios, but I'm hopeful that, you know, again, someone's gonna create some open source software for indie developers as well to do that. Yeah, that's gonna be interesting. Um, a, a lot of thoughts around that, but we've got about five minutes left, so let's, let's keep going. Um, um, honestly, I kind of want to skip this, and I was wondering if, uh, since we only have three minutes left here, do you guys have any questions that we can answer, whether about blockchain, whether about AI? Um, is there anything that you guys are interested in learning more about? We're happy to speak about it. We have one left. Hi, guys. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I'm from uh, I'm Rajiv from Circular Games. Uh, we yeah we are already building uh, we already build and already live uh, games on uh, Web3. Uh, one uh, right now we have it on third party token, but one of the key advice I get from a lot of the invest uh, advisors or investors is okay why uh, why do I have to actually launch my own token? Why can't I use a third party token which is out there like a stable token like USDT, B, uh, B, not BTC, uh, ETH or something like that? It's already there. So that is uh, something I would like to hear your opinion. Should I actually go with my own token in the future, or should I actually uh, be open and use a third-party token? I'm not sure I caught the last part. Should you open your own? Uh, should I launch my own token so that uh, I can start using Obviously, it has its own advantage. But one advice I keep getting is, OK, why, is there are enough tokens out there. Why don't you use a third-party token, like a stable token, USDT, ETH? So an advice from that angle. Okay, so uh, I think there was some sort of a lag there, but uh, from what I understood, you're asking if it's a good idea to launch your own token or sort of rely on the stable coins that, there are, that are there. Um, I think in terms of stable coins, that effectively does become Web2-ish because now you're just using you know, stable coin. Uh, but again, you know, if you have an economy, and again, you know, we, we, we didn't speak too much about it because of the time constraints, but if you have a good enough, enough economy, and that takes months to create, right? Sometimes years. And f for example, one of our advisors, Matt Sog, uh, he wrote the original lines of code at Valorant, right? And he was he was a data, data analyst there. So we are creating our economy models with him. And right now, he's uh, effectively the CTO at Solana Labs, heading product and tech at Solana Labs. So with him, we're creating these economies. And and I I'm not sure how much difference it's going to make um, if you just go stablecoin or your own token. Um, as a studio, you probably want your own token. You know what we're thinking of doing is having a gold on token instead of a rage effect token, so that it can be we can have a. And this was on the previous slide, but we could have a shareable economy throughout all of you know our games, gold on studios games. So that's going to be rage effect, could be rage effect two, three, whatever, and just shared economies throughout all these games. So having your own token in that sense makes sense. Of course, tokens act as access. Uh, utility stuff as well, you know, access portals. For example, DLCs you can get through uh, purchasing tokens and then, you know, uh, uh, purchasing DLCs through tokens rather. And then you've got so many other use cases that we have for Rage Effect as well. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're creating an economy and we're using machinations for it, that's why we asked how many of you are, um, it's probably a good idea to go with your own token. USDC would help you in the security side of things, right? Uh, but when it comes to your own token, you need to do all the auditing for it. Uh, by the way, trust me, auditing takes a long time. 
Uh, it's very expensive, very expensive. And uh, so th yeah, there's pros and cons to that, but for us, if we had to do, if we had, had a choice, I think we would still uh, stick with our own, our own token. I also don't think there's a clear answer to this without playing your game, right? I think that's, uh, that's really the challenge. Is, the, is a token right for you, or do you just kind of need in-game transactions, right? If you just need in-game transactions, maybe stick with USDC, but hey, if you're like creating, again, these competitive price pool or creating economies where it's creating larger value, then maybe a token makes sense, right? Um, but we can talk about it more afterwards once you know I learn more what your game's about. Maybe I can offer some more tailored advice. Yeah, for sure. And I think the trend in itself from what I'm hearing in all these spaces and like you know, talking to other founders is that, previous slide, is that um, Web 2.5 might be the way to go, right? So instead of having your own governance tokens and instead of having a DAO structure in every community, um, start little by little, right? Start stepwise, put in NFTs first, not a lot of them, just a few, just to see how things go. We haven't launched anyth anything yet, we haven't launched any NFTs, we haven't launched any crypto yet. We're still looking at the market, we're still understanding how things work, uh, because things keep changing, right? In a, in a new industry, in a Web3 industry, things keep changing. So yeah, Web 2.5 is the way to go. Um, that's what we're hearing, that's what we're going to do. And um, yeah. Thank you. Sounds great. That's all great. from our side, I guess. Yeah, time Eddie, for lunch. Oh, you got more questions. Sure, let's uh, here for as long as you guys need. I think Pirun is a bit hungry, huh? I'm a little hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, yep. uh, so my question is like, uh, does NFTs allow your game assets uh, to be like pervasive into other games? Like, uh, for example, CS Goka, you have some cosmetic you buy it as an NFT and you know, you put it into Valorant. Like, uh, does it make it like uh, any asset that you own from a game, any skin legendary might be. So you, you are now able to, you know, reuse it in other games and also sell it. So that is something that NFT allows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the premise. That's like a, a big use case. That's actually the biggest use case of NFTs, right? People say, oh, NFTs give you two ownership, but the truth is no one cares about it. That's what we found out. A gamer does not care about actually owning his NFTs or like, you know. So a big use case why even investors were putting in so much money was that the fact that, you know, when you look at Counter-Strike, when you look at skins in, in Counter-Strike, right, these skins, some of these skins are selling for $500,000 US, right? How are they selling? You have middlemen, you know, who you have to trust, by the way, there's no actual, like, proper marketplace for that. So you have middlemen you know, facilitating the transaction between users. So when you have your own NFT in your own game, obviously you have third, market park, uh, third party marketplaces, uh, but you also have your own in-game marketplace. That's what we're going to do. So it's, it's basic for user design, user experience. You don't have to click three other places, you know, and go to some other place. It's, everything is in one game. Um, and thankfully a lot of SDKs are helping us with that. But um, yeah, so that's like a big use case. And I think the other thing you mentioned was a little bit more along the interoperability science as well. So kind of strike skins that you have you can use those in other games which share the same engine as Counter-Strike and the same blockchain. I mean, I'm not sure though necessarily that people don't care about ownership. Um, no, <laughs> it's, I think it's an easy thing to say, right? But like again, in the Apex Legends example, when this game was taken away and their assets were taken away, that's when they did care about ownership. That's a good example. So sure, maybe they don't care about ownership in like, you know, in, in an everyday sense where like, you know, they're like, oh yeah, this, I own this asset, but once you take, away, take it away from them, that's when they care about ownership. It's kind of like human rights, right? Yeah. Everyone expects to have it, but you only realize you're missing them when they take them away from you. I think Rainbow Six Siege had that issue. Yeah, um, a few games. I think we had one last question. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's very nice talk, nice talk. I am Meghna and we are a VFX studio. We are into Web3 as well. So we are building a 9,999 collection of an art which are called Apes Far From Home. And we're also in building a metaverse, which is also a marketplace as well as a game. So it's been a year since we have started. We are a team of VFX artists. We work for films and commercials. So uh, my question is, like we are into this Web3 space from uh, last one, two years. And we have, we have the whole collection ready. 
and as an art like we have done it because like from the artist point of view we were great with the art but uh, coming to the utilities part uh, how like what is your take on utilities uh, how important do you think utilities are coming to our, uh, coming to our project uh, like we have a whole uh, set of this whole set of collection has an interlink with the metaverse which we are going to build so this is a game as well as a marketplace which we want to build for small time businesses and other businesses as well so uh, now uh, like our utilities are just that uh, people whoever buys get the, like whoever are into the community whoever buy the nft they'll be getting uh, advantage in the metaverse like after every sale they'll be getting some uh, util like uh, benefits in the metaverse yeah. so now uh, my question is uh, how important do you think are utilities uh, to sell a project to sell an nft i mean look the reason why all these nfts from 2 years ago fail uh, i guess you can call them failed if they've gone and gone down like 70 80% right um it's because they didn't have utilities now there are a lot of projects like let's take board apes for example the biggest project right after crypto punks i guess everyone owned it all the bigger influencers all the kevin harts of the world all the justin biebers all the eminems of the world all of them owned it um the thing is the idea was that it's a club you are part of a club exclusive club not everyone can get into it right um but later you know as markets crash and things happen in the world and economies change um things are subject to changing and then what people realize is that utility is important right you can't just be a part of a club like the club then has to have utility right um and then so like even you know about not not necessarily now or this, this month or the months before this but there was a time frame i think last year for at least a year um when every single week i was getting emails from different projects saying hey can we do this with you guys can we do this with you guys because they are looking for utility right and even now i mean we have so we we host tournaments with a few uh, nft projects we host tournaments with a few guilds and stuff like that because they need utility right they need action for their community and they're willing to spend money for it so they're willing to spend $500 $400 to host tournaments so utility is the most important thing i mean that's what money is right money is value what's value it's utility so you need to and you also mentioned something about a metaverse yes yeah so i mean we we had that mentioned on the slide unfortunately we had to skip it but i mean all these trends i wouldn't call it a metaverse to be honest in this market because the, these buzzwords they've died right even nft so i was i was speaking with venture solana ventures and they mentioned uh, they advised not to use the word nfts right use digital assets instead don't use nfts use digital assets and that's what we have on the, on our website as well tradable digital assets or collectibles or collectibles, collectibles yes yeah. so uh, i mean metaverse i would stay away from that um obviously recently i don't know if you guys saw the news from meta but they the oculus right it's so realistic um i think the metaverse might have a comeback might maybe uh maybe through a different name but it's definitely definitely going to come back and i mentioned apple vision pro as well if you guys check that out on the on the trends thing the future um so vr games are going to come back pop back on uh apple vision pro i think is going to lead the next wave uh it's important to know that these games have been up vr and ar they've been things before but um they didn't stick around right snapchat tried a lot they put in a lot of money it didn't work out but i mean apple is apple right so let's see how that works out and, although uh, apple's not very good with games so you know yeah no i mean with the product right so they've got the vision pro and that's revolutionary although oculus is doing a similar thing but the world responds to apple so let's see how how the world responds to vision pro also on your on the idea of the metaverse right it's uh, i think it's probably another hour long conversation on what uh, the metaverse yeah. is yeah because if you look think about it like fortnite is a metaverse and it's doing phenomenally GTA well. GTA is a metaverse. Yeah. Roblox is a metaverse. They're doing fantastically well too. So uh, by the way, just a quick note guys, in case you want to wear Decentraland and actually Pirun is the guy who told me. Yeah, I think it was Pirun. Um Decentraland how so these guys is they're valued at a billion dollars, right? Can you guess how many daily active users these guys have? Any guess? valued at a billion dollars right all of snoop dog has land there all these celebrities have land there any guess daily active users <laughs> okay 5000 that's one any other random guess could be any 10000 2000 500 okay 1 lakh 27 27 
27 daily active users. That's what the report said on TechCrunch. Technically, the report was wrong. It was still, it was like about 500. I so mean, it was 27 people who were plugged in with wallets and about a total of about like 483 that were playing with like wallets and offline. Or whatever 27 transactions wallets. basically, which is not good for a billion dollars. No, not, not 27 transactions, 27 people logged in with wallets. Yeah, so that's 27 users. So it's not even like users. they're spending money. Yeah. Is that Stan? Oh, there you go. Nice to see you, man. It's been a while. Sweet. Right. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, guys you guys for attending. Uh, Great to be able to answer your questions. And uh, yeah, I mean, please reach out. We'll be around. And uh, if you have any questions, anything, happy to connect. And uh, yeah, see you guys soon.